You're watching a Euractiv Thought Leadership interview and today we're going to be discussing the EU space programme and to understand if the EU is going boldly where no man has gone before, I'm joined by the Executive Director of USPA, the EU Agency for the Space Programme, Rodrigo da Costa. Mr. Da Costa, pleasure to have you with us on Euractive. Thank you for having me um, this morning. Now it's only been, and I say only, because it has only been 62 years since man first went into space. What does Europe want to achieve in space? Uh, the European ambition in space uh, is really, really a large one. I think we see it um, across the years. There has been growing investment. There has been growing uh, interest, also public interest, on what space technology brings. Of course, there's always uh, a dream element to, to it, but there's also a lot of reality um, of what space is already bringing to us um, every day. And clearly, uh, on the side of the European Union, we have seen a deeper and deeper involvement of the Union in space, um, always with the focus of a space that is oriented towards people, towards the citizens, towards bringing benefits to the citizens. And I think that's really, in the, in the end, in a nutshell, uh, that is the ambition of uh, the EU in space, is to bring benefits uh, to the citizens. Okay, now Jasper's mission is to deliver on the EU space programme goals. Take us through um, what your ambition is and how you help Europe deliver on its mission in space. Uh, our mission as an agency uh, is uh, very, very closely linked indeed to the EU space programme, which is, as such, is a, is a new programme, um, but it builds uh, upon, of course, a long history already of uh, uh, Europe's work in space, in the domains of navigation, satellite navigation, in the domains of Earth observation and of technology development. And this is the history um, that uh, came all together under uh, a programme umbrella back uh, in the year 2021 when the space regulation created the space program and with it, it created uh, our agency. Um, the role of our agency is indeed to bring that program to work and we do that by working on uh, three main pillars, uh, our three main pillars of activity, um, which is uh, exploitation, security and market. And I'll come to that uh, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Just let me say as well that obviously we do not work in such a large program alone uh, because the program is also about establishing partnerships, uh, naturally with the institutions, with the European Commission, with the member states, with the European Parliament, but also working very close together with the European Space Agency and uh, with industry, uh, both the upstream industry, the downstream industry, um, but it's really about this ecosystem and how this ecosystem uh, can uh, deliver. Um, looking at the three main elements briefly about the mission of the agency. So starting with exploitation. What does that mean? Uh, that means to use uh, the systems we have. So it means to provide services, to provide data, to provide the signals from space uh, that allow the users to uh, use uh, the space, uh, the space technology, space data and space services. It's a lot about operations. So it's a, a lot about 24 seven work to ensure that Galileo is providing services with the necessary accuracy, with the necessary reliability. Uh, same um, for EGNOS. Uh, it is about as well developing a new governmental satellite communication capability for Europe with GovSatcom. And then second uh, very important pillar is the pillar of security, which is about ensuring the security of the systems, but as well to make uh, uh, sure that uh, space data, space services can be used for security related applications, security related missions. And last but not least, and since we are talking about a significant investment, it is key that this investment comes to the people. And therefore comes the user, the user part, the market uptake. Uh, and there we do a lot of work in making sure that uh, all these complex signals, this complex technology can be transformed in very concrete applications that citizens can use on their mobile phones, that uh, um, businesses can use on their uh, in-vehicle applications uh, that bring concrete solutions to very different areas of the economy. And this is the three main areas where we work. So would you say that the goals of the space program change according to the times and the advancement of technology as well? I would say definitely the goals of the space program and more globally, the goals of the EU uh, in space, they evolve. They evolve naturally um, because um, as we advance, and this is a trend that we have been seeing in uh, many years, um, as we advance, uh, 
we end up discovering that there are more benefits uh, from space in other businesses um, where actually some time ago space was not present at all. Uh, le let me give you let me give you a very interesting example. I found it very interesting myself when I when I found out about that, which is um, space technology, space data uh, in the world of insurance and finance. It's not something that would come to the immediate reflection of all of us. Okay, not at all. No, <laughs> the banking sector, the insurance sector. Well, it is actually the reality already today, uh, and it is a market that has a lot of potential for growth in the use of space for different things. Um, for example, bank transactions, uh, when you transfer money, when you buy or sell stocks, uh, all these transactions they need to be stamped with very precise, at a, a very precise timely. Ultimately, to guarantee that, for example, if you do fast transactions, you do not sell before you buy, for example. Uh, this timing can be ensured in a very precise manner if you use uh, uh, satellite navigation data. So do you think the everyday citizen in Europe understands um, the sort of interconnectivity when it comes to what space actually provides beyond just exploration? I think the European citizen understands more and more uh, what space brings, uh, but of course there's still a lot of work, and by the way, a lot of work on our side, on the institutional side, to really show and demonstrate the uh, advantages of space. Of course, it is important to uh, be very clear in explaining that when you are ordering food using your mobile phone, actually you are using space data. Where you are navigating from A to B with your car, you are using uh, space data. I'm not sure this is the reality, uh, this is, uh, uh, I mean, clearly understood by everyone whenever these actions are taken. Um, uh, but it is a matter of fact that nowadays, about 50% of all applications a uh, normal person has downloaded in his uh, or her um, uh, cell phone, is uh, including space data, typically navigation data. So you see how the use is really widely spread. No, that's, that's, that's really, really interesting. Well, let's come to the, the satellites then. Um, you know, satellites, of course, such a big part of the infrastructure, of the way in which we live. You were talking there about data. They provide essential communication for the everyday person, not just, you know, the astronauts um, up in space. Now, Ukraine, you know, this is a country, you know, um, in war, um, fighting for its survival, um, and they've been able to use Starlink satellites to really help them try to at least fight Russia back. Um, so satellites, of course, have this massive benefit, you know, for Ukraine. Um, talk us through also the GovSatcom and how that keeps Com secure for Europe. I think indeed uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated and has, has made it visible probably to the general public the importance uh, of space data also in a situation of, uh, of, of conflict. Um, and there clearly uh, Europe, uh, the European Union, has very important capabilities in the domain of space, key, cap key capabilities in the domain of satellite navigation, of Earth observation, two key pillars uh, of space activities. And now we are developing also uh, capabilities in the domain of secured communication. Um, member states, some member states have these capabilities, but at the union level, this is something that is now being created. A first step is GovSatcom. GovSatcom is about a, it's a very simple principle. It's a principle of pooling and sharing capabilities. So those member states that have secured communication capabilities that were built nationally, uh, some of those would like to make them available to the, their EU partners. Our function as an agency is to connect that by using the appropriate infrastructure, the right set of computers, to connect and create that availability of a secure communication cap capability that exists uh, in some member states to uh, make it available to other member states. But there is more than that. Uh, and indeed, uh, Parliament and uh, Council are uh, finishing the process uh, of uh, likely soon uh, approving a new regulation that will define a new flagship program for Europe, uh, ERI Square, uh, which is about secure connectivity. So it's building, of course, GovSatcom will be an element of secure connectivity, but it will build beyond that um, because it is about to create an infrastructure uh, dedicated primarily to secure communications, um, bringing together, of course, a uh, private commercial angle, but also a very important governmental utilization uh, and bringing indeed 
top level, uh, top notch technologies, state of the art technologies, to make sure that this uh, new constellation um, is, is, is really state of the art, is really the best in class once it comes to the market. There are very concrete objectives that were set to the program. Uh, and let's say to the space community uh, in terms of uh, clear delivery dates. Uh, and of course, we are already starting anticipating some of the work that we expect will come our way very soon. And so how can all of this technology that you're talking about really help be an economic enabler? Um, you know, not just for, you know, tech, for things like AI, but also sustainability and climate change. Technology from space helps indeed in a very, very wide set of uh, domains. Uh, I think right now it's actually difficult to find domains where one way or the other space is not contributing. And if we look for a moment about sustainability, if we look at uh, Green Deal, clearly uh, there is uh, a very, very intimate link uh, between the achievement of the Green Deal objectives uh, and space technologies. Uh, let me give you a few examples. Uh, how do we make our transport more efficient? Uh, car transport, rail transport, aviation transport. Well, space contributes to that. Whenever you are using an application to go from A to B, uh, you are making your way shorter or you are driving less time, which means you are spending less fuel, so it is becoming more sustainable. But also, uh, space data, positioning data, helps us and helps in particular uh, public authorities make public transport more efficient. Better connections, uh, better information to the users, a more user-friendly public transport, which will hopefully attract people from moving from their private cars into public transport. That's fascinating, and I, I, I hope everyone you know listening to this um, understands all of this a little bit more. What about then the energy mix? Is there anything where space can contribute to make us um, have greener options and to have more sustainable options for energy? Uh, certainly. Also in the energy sector, there are very diverse and very interesting um, applications. Um, first of all, uh, one of the challenges in the management of energy right now um, uh, is the fact that uh, typical, the production of energy and the consumption of energy they do not take place in the same place. Uh, it used to be a bit different in the past because normally you had the big power plant not very far away from the city, not very far away from uh, the factories. Now it is true that uh, when we are talking in particular about sustainable uh, uh, energy, solar energy, wind energy, water energy, normally that is produced quite far away uh, from the places where it is ultimately consumed. Think, for example, uh, on the North Sea uh, wind parks. Uh, it's not there that the energy is consumed. It is consumed in the factories. It is consumed in the cities. Um, transport of energy is therefore a challenge. But you have to imagine we are talking about huge networks of um, uh, energy transport. And one of the key challenges, it's not the only one, but one of the key challenges is the synchronization between those networks to avoid power peaks or power drops that may even be dangerous to the network. Well, space can help you on that because uh, with satellite navigation uh, uh, data, and in particular with the timing data, we can achieve very, very precise a time synchronization between grids. That's amazing. Okay, well, a final question then. Um, how can the EU space program really keep pace with a US, for example, you know, a country that puts almost 15 billion euros more per year into their space ambition? And also when you have private competitors like Elon Musk um, entering the space as well, where's Europe's place and how can it stay competitive? Oh. So, uh, let me tackle your question in two ways. First, let's look at the past and the present, what we have achieved by now. Um, I think we Europeans have to be very proud of what we have achieved in terms of space technology. Uh, if we look at Copernicus, Copernicus is a u unique uh, Earth observation system with satellites, with in-situ measurements, with a huge amount of data. It is so unique that it's of course, widely used in Europe, but also our partners around the world are using Copernicus. Uh, there is no competition to Copernicus, neither in terms of the data that is collected, be it in terms of quality, be it in terms of quantity. If we put the, all that uh, together, Copernicus is really unique. This is an achievement of Europe. If you look at uh, uh, Galileo, Galileo is demonstrating an excellent performance. Uh, measured data shows Galileo being much better, much more precise 
than any of its competitors, some of them actually quite know, well known household names. Um, but Galileo, in terms of accuracy, is better, and it is significantly better. And I think, again, as Europeans, we have to be proud. This is European technology, these are the European capabilities. Uh, and I think this is uh, very important to take stock first. Then let's look at the future. When we look at the future, clearly there is an advancement of technology. Uh, and if Galileo has become today the most precise of the systems, it will not stay uh, like that always. If today Copernicus is state of the art, if we don't continue evolving, if we don't continue moving forward, um, of course at a certain point in time it will not be anymore. So of course uh, we, we need to accompany with the space program, with the program activities, the technology developments and ensure that we remain attractive and we remain competitive. Because as long as Galileo is competitive, is attractive, people will tend to use it. It is more precise. Why are you going to use a system that is less precise? And by the way, right now, but many, many people are using Galileo. We have more than 3 billion receivers worldwide equipped with Galileo. A modern mobile phone will be equipped with Galileo. So there is this angle of the necessity to keep pace. So the, Euro the European ambition in space needs to continue and needs to continue growing as well. Mr. Da Costa, thank you so much for joining us here on Your Active. Thank you so much. Thank you.